very excited to be um, welcoming our guest today. Uh, many of you know Dr. Morgan Greff. Um, Morgan is the executive director of the Rhode Island Historical Society, a position she has held since 2011. And prior to this, she served as a director of the Noel Goff Center for Education and Public Programs at the Historical Society beginning in 2005. And I cannot believe that. Seems like not that long ago, but yeah, been a while. <laughs> She holds a BA and an MA in American Civilization from the University of Pennsylvania and earned a PhD in American Civilization from Brown University in 2005. Her work as a historian focuses on U.S. social, cultural, and architectural history with special attention on carceral history, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, public history, and Rhode Island. She makes her home in Pawtucket with her spouse, artist Gage Prentice, and their three exceptional cats. And I think we just met one. <laughs> so Morgan, I'll turn the program to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Thanks for having me back. Can you hear me okay? I've got a new mic. Great. Um, so thank you everyone for spending um, some of your um your Sunday afternoon with the museum and with me. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today to uh, kick off our annual theme of Rhode Island and the world. So as you might recall, every year the RAHS has a pretty broad theme um, that helps and guides us uh, through our programming and our initiatives. And so today is really, um, uh, kind of overview and taste of some of what we mean when we say Rhode Island and the world. So as we go through today's program, I'm going to be hitting on a number of points, but it is a pretty broad overview. And so when I do that, there may be um, a book or an article or an exhibit that I think really exemplifies uh, this idea. And there are ways in which you can dig deeper into what I'll be talking about. So um, I encourage you um, to do that. So this is just a, a brief look, um, but there are excellent ways um, that you can learn more about this. So um, without further ado, I'm going to um, get started into our presentation. And let's hope here. Um, one of the things that makes it challenging is uh, is that it blocks out. I've got to move our little uh, Zoom bar here so I can actually get this started. And how is that? Can everyone see that okay? Anne, could you let me know if, if that's visible? It's good. Great, thank you. So here in Rhode Island, we often think of Newport um, as exemplifying the grand wealth of the Gilded Age. Um, and that wealth that we see um, in the buildings, in the uh, private homes of Newport is really often centered in New York. However, the great little state of Rhode Island had much to do with generating the profound amount of money that is uh, being produced in the United States and is traveling that what they're making is traveling around the world. In fact, when we're looking around 1900, and 1900 will really be that hinge date we're talking about today, we're looking at 1900, Rhode Island is the wealthiest state uh, measured per capita. Um, and that wealth really centers around Rhode Island as an industrial center. To this day, organizations like the Brookings Institute, one of the measures that they use um, to understand the health of a city and the kind of productive value of a city, the number of patents that are uh, created and obtained by people living there. And in this period in Rhode Island, no one, I mean, in, in history, no one could compete with Rhode Island. So Rhode Island is producing more uh, patents per capita than anywhere else. And it really is that industrial um, sense that moves it forward. So we're going to look at today is a bit of that industrial power. Who's doing that labor? Where are they coming from? Um, at some point, where is that labor going and the product going to? 
And so this period is really interesting as we're um, looking internally, but then also looking as we move towards World War, World War I. And we see a lot of changes in our economy in that period and the worldliness of what it is that we're doing. So I want to be very clear, though. Rhode Island and all of our economies have always had a global aspect to them. When we look earlier, of course, the um, to the merchant capitalist period, we're looking at trade such as the slave trade, the West Indies trade, the China trade. There has always been this global component to our economy. So what we're looking at here is just a particular snapshot or period and what some of that global aspect looks like in that moment. So as many of you might know, of course, the Museum of Work and Culture is a hub for discussions about uh, manufacturing, about industry, about labor. And so when I found this photo, um, I was struck because we're often invited and engaged in current day manufacturing conversations. And um, and so. What photo? Hold on. <laughs> I can hear you, loser. Um, <laughs> Sorry, it is that photo. Can we see, um, did we see a photo change there? Oh, that photo. Yes. So right now we're looking at the Manufacturing Association dinner. There is still, of course, an active Manufacturing Association in Rhode Island. And this is what one of their dinners look like. Um, in the last few years, I've had the pleasure of going to some of the manufacturing dinners. And I will say that they are now slightly less male, um, just slightly. Um, and so, but what we can see here is really, this is the scions of industry, and this is um, an annual gathering that suggests sort of the grand nature and the wealth of these um, organizations. We also made a name for ourselves in places like the international exhibitions or the world's fairs, as it were. So this is a, an image from the 1876. Uh, World's Fair that was the centennial World's Fair held in Fairmont Park in Philadelphia. And this is the great Corliss engine. This Corliss engine was uh, manufactured and created in Rhode Island uh, by George Corliss's firm and is actually used um, to power the fair itself. And so it is not just there in one of the Rhode Island houses or in the manufacturing pavilion. It is in fact generating the massive amount of power that is needed for this fair. So it became an attraction and in fact um, showed in many ways the industrial power of this small state. Um, and so this was a really wonderful display. And for those of you who are interested um, in George Corliss, um, you can read about him a bit in uh, a book we'll talk about later, Jed Carboni's book, uh, The Measure of America, and his relationship to Brown and Sharp. But I also want to point out for those of you who are doing and interested in doing research, there are two George Corliss's in Providence, and they are unrelated. Um, and so you may see the George Corliss house down on North Main Street uh, or in South Main Street. That is not this George Corliss. Um, so uh, make sure if you're uh, digging into this that you're looking for the Corliss with two S's, not the Corliss with one S. And many people could uh, be uh, seen as uh, having a particular niche or a particular amount of power, these industrial companies that will see snippets of uh, like Nicholson file. But really, the concentration of power in Rhode Island could be seen probably best in this man right here. And this is Senator Nelson Aldrich. And on the on the right, you'll see the Aldrich House, which happens to be the RIHS headquarters in Providence. That was his city residence at one point. And uh, Aldrich really showcases what it means to go up through the ranks from working in a, a family uh, food uh, grocery store and working his way up through to becoming um, the head of the Senate, a uh, person referred to as the general manager of the United States. Um, and so he held tremendous power on the national stage. Locally, he was uh, incredibly wealthy and um, was the uh, part owner, along with people like Marston Perry of the trolley company uh, and the newspaper. Um, 
And so he was part of the union busting that is going on in this period. He was not seen as a friend to labor, much more of a friend to, um, to the kind of industry and the business itself. In fact, in his role in the Senate, he was in charge of business regulation. Um, but as such, he was also uh, made a lot of his money investing in sugar, exactly what he was also creating regulations on. We might uh, see this as a conflict of interest today, um, and in fact, it's no longer allowed. But during this period, uh, this was uh, something that was being done not just by Aldrich, but by a number of other people in these positions of power in the at the federal level. But he goes on to more fame by really creating the framework of the Federal Reserve. So he is an important figure um, in understanding how the structure of business, the structure of banking is created, not just in Rhode Island, but nationally and globally in this period. And yet he's a figure who is quite often overlooked in U.S. history of this period. We think more of the people who, uh, like Rockefeller, whose names remain, um, and in fact, a family that his daughter marries into. At the time of that marriage, it was seen as a very smart and equal match, um, but the Rockefeller's family fame continued um, uh, much further than the Aldrich name did. But there were some unsightly side effects, as they were called, of this. Right here, we see an image of the Red Bridge going over the Seekonk River, so between Providence and East Providence. And so we can see the effects of industry uh, on the health of the river, um, not just on the view. So many people in Providence were focusing on the view from the east side over to East Providence. But others were, in fact, starting to uh, examine the effects that this was having on our waterways. And I really urge you, if you haven't yet, to get up to the Museum of Work and Culture and to look at the new exhibit flowing through time. And you can see the ways in which industry, in fact, um, impacts this river and then the way that humans, uh, again, took charge of, of that uh, to try to remediate some of what industry did. So this is not something in this period that is going unnoticed. People are talking about um, it for appearance sake, and they're talking about it in terms of the environmental damage. There just aren't a lot of regulations yet, and there's not a lot of, of plans as to what to do about it. Um, and so these are just, um, I think, important for us to also look at not just the beautiful postcard images we see of the mills, but of actually um, what it looked like to be an active factory town at the time. So as I mentioned, uh, in the late 1900, uh, 19th century, there was a lot of shifting within our city lines and the creations of new cities and towns in Rhode Island. 1862, we have East Providence, 1871, Woonsocket, 1895, Central Falls. So distinct lines are really being drawn between urban uh, and rural life in this period. So we have this concentration of, uh, of urban life in Rhode Island and uh, even in America. And the state is growing very, very quickly. Providence today and 1900, in fact, have very similar populations. Um, but in 1900, um, that meant that Providence was the 20th largest city in the United States. So that population that we um, have around 178,000 um, meant that we were a very large and significant city. Providence, as uh, 1900, was about 175,000 people, but there were only about 429,000 people in Rhode Island. So you can see that this concentration of people around Providence and that Providence of areas more than a third of the state. So now we look at that same number, but there are more than a million people. So you can see that there's a diffusion of the population through the state rather than that concentration that we saw at 1900. And in 1900, almost 32% of people in Providence were foreign born. This is pretty typical of East Coast cities at the time. When we get out to the Midwest, that drops to about 10%. And in, for uh, purposes of comparison, today in Providence proper, not just Providence County, we're looking at about 30% foreign born today. So it's again, a similar number of people and a similar amount of foreign born, simply different countries being represented. 
Rhode Island's uh, capital was um, in 1800. Okay, so we're going 100 years earlier. 1800, Providence is the ninth largest city in the US. That's basically comparable to Dallas today. Um, by 1900, as I mentioned, it was the 20th. Um, but really, the war exodus, the city slowly drops down the list in the latter half of the 20th century, just to give you an idea of when um, the rest of the country is growing and Providence is sort of stagnating in its size. Um, so we moved down to 37th in 1940 to 43rd in 1950. 56 and then number 100 by 1980 and then we no longer appear on the list after 1980. So you can really see that that change um, happening in the last quarter, but the diminution of population really is a 20th century phenomenon. So to give you again this idea 1900 state population of 428,000 10 years later. The population of Providence uh, County is 542,000. So it has grown by more than 100,000 in 10 years. Providence City alone grew by almost 50,000. And Rhode Island, of course, is making a name for itself with major textile outfits. But percentage wise, um, it's a big part of Rhode Island's economy. But we never could compete with the amount of production coming out of places like Massachusetts in textiles. So textiles were big for us, but we were not big nationally in textiles, if that makes sense. But by 1880, Rhode Island leads the way in US jewelry manufacturing. So again, textiles are important to us, but we are not a big textile producer nationally. 18, by 1880, Rhode Island is controlling 25% of all of the jewelry manufacturing coming out of the United States. So we are a huge power within the jewelry industry. What that means is in 1890, there were about 200 firms with 7,000 employees in jewelry manufacturing. This also then moves into uh, and is related to the growth in precision manufacturing and heavy metals and metalwork that's coming out of Rhode Island. So a couple things to keep in mind uh, as we talk about different pieces or as you learn about uh, textile history and Woonsocket's history, um, you'll hear certain phrases in case you don't know and wanna know. Uh, mercerizing comes up quite a bit in the Woonsocket area. Um, and if you've ever wondered, uh, that is a process in which it's a, a, the, that is applied to cellulose fibers that makes it more able to absorb water, therefore more easily dyed, making the colors deeper and brighter and less likely to uh, fade over time. It also makes fabric resist lint and mildew. So mercerizing is a huge component of what's happening in the, the factories around the Blackstone Valley. And you'll also hear worsteds come up a whole lot. And this is a fi fine and smooth um, yarn from combed long staple wool. So worsteds are long, they're smooth, and they're slick and woven. So we're using these in the clothing industry quite frequently. So just words that frequently come up and no one um, usually has time to ask, what, what does that actually mean? So here is an, uh, an image of one of the largest and most powerful um, companies of the period, Nicholson File. Um, seems funny to say that a file company would be uh, that important, but in fact, when you have all of these factories, they need these machine tools and files to make what they're making. And Nicholson File allows other factories to flourish. So as you might imagine, many of the people, like the men you see in this image, are coming to Rhode Island from other countries. The immigration that Rhode Island saw at the end of the 19th century um, is in many ways from groups that continue to define Rhode Island's character today, Italian, Portuguese, French Canadian, Polish. Seven out of 10 people in Rhode Island were first or second generation Americans. And most of these people had no standing to vote. Of course, women couldn't vote, wouldn't wanna trust them with the franchise. Um, and at this point, every city and town sent the same number of reps to the house. Uh, allowing rural voices to drown out urban voices. Providence, in fact, still had a law in the books that required foreign-born men to own real estate before they could vote in city elections. 
This meant that two thirds of adult males who qualified to vote in state elections could not vote in city elections. So one of the ways in which we see this kind of um, manifested, this is just um, a quote from Paul Nicholson. And when I first read it, you know, much of what we do at the society, and we, we recently obtained a huge collection from Nicholson file, um, is that we go through these materials. And I was reading this quote and getting really excited because rarely do you find the heads of these organizations speaking about things like immigration, speaking about prejudice and racism and the things that people are facing. And um, I share with you this quote because as a, as a researcher, sometimes we get really excited and it's important that we hold that excitement at bay sometimes. Um, so please um, bear with me to the end of this quote. With constant productions and selling connections established, it was hoped that bright days now lay ahead but such was not the case. Our little company, fighting for its very existence, had a far more serious and uncontrollable barrier still to hurdle. The ruthless struggle of a desperate industry being slowly eliminated by its own inherent weaknesses and by traditional prejudices of the consumer against machine cut files. See, I really didn't think we were going to go with a prejudice against machine cut files, but for Nicholson file, it really was what was holding them back. So the prejudices of the day were, in fact, uh, a little bit different to the people running the industries than I expected them to be. But the prejudices of the days found their ways, most certainly, into our publications of the period, especially places like the Providence Journal and Providence Magazine. So here we see an image that's very frequently shared um, in Rhode Island of uh, men and women and children arriving in these immigration ports. And I share with you this quote from 1917 from Providence Magazine. So far, the Native Americans, meaning Yankees, not meaning indigenous peoples, the Native Americans have watched these foreign invasions as if they were helpless. They surrendered North Main and South Main streets to Portuguese, Jews, and Armenians with little regret. But they are giving up their homes on Broadway and other pleasant streets, not from choice, but for the reason that undesirable buildings have changed the character of their neighborhoods. Even on the East Side Hill, there is no security from encroachment. For coincident with the building of pleasant homes along Blackstone Boulevard, Cheap three-deckers are being erected farther north and in the very heart of the district, apartment houses are getting numerous so that there is an attack from within and from the rear. And so of course, well, and for those of you who have joined us when we talk about triple-deckers, they use language that addresses the building of apartment houses in triple-deckers. What they're very much talking about is the encroachment of new peoples into the environments who need to live in these houses. So one of the largest companies of this time um, helps us to understand the ways in which uh, workers who are coming in are uh, changing the shape of Rhode Island, but also what it means then in their relationship with manufacturers and the rest of the world as their products go out. So in 1833, David Brown and his son opened a shop in Providence for the making and repair of watches and clocks and other precision mechanical works. Lucian Sharp joined the business as an apprentice in 1848 and became a full partner in 1853. While Brown concentrated on mechanical problems, Sharp provided business acumen. Together, they made Brown and Sharp into a nationally recognized machine tool producer. And again, I recommend Carboni's um, uh, The Measure of America if you want to learn more about the, the Brown and Sharp company and family. It's a really wonderful book. Um, Brown and Sharp products were the day-to-day -day tools that machinists uh, of machinists that allowed them to produce the individual parts of complex manufacturing machines. Machinists and their products they make constitute the foundation of precision manufacturing. So in 18, the 1850s marked the spectacular rise of Brown and Sharp. Brown devoted his career to rising standards of accuracy in machine shop operations. He built an automatic linear dividing engine uh, so fundamentally correct in its design and workmanship 
that it has remained in continuous service since the 1850s. His pocket vernier cal calipers, a linear measuring instrument of 1851, has been called, quote, the first practical tool for exact measurement, which could be sold in any country at, at, at a price within the reach of an ordinary machinist. In 1861, and perhaps his most important contribution, Brown invented the modern universal milling machine for cutting spirals. This machine helped advance mass production of cheap, interchangeable, and standard parts. After Brown's death in 1876, Oscar Beale became the company's genius in the field of mechanical design. He developed measuring machines that enabled the company to make and sell its gauges with a guarantee of accuracy to one ten thousandth of an inch. In 1880, he invented the automatic screw machine. So Brown and Sharp's success depended and helped to advance the mechanization of daily life in the 19th century. The machine tools the company's, uh, company produced proved instrumental to countless automotive, aeronautical, commercial, and domestic products. Brown and Sharp's skilled workforce contributed to the development of automobile and aviation industries in the emergence of the, is, and the emergence of the United States as a global leader in manufacturing. The image we see here is the first steel frame factory in the United States. It's 66,000 square feet uh, with 20 over 20 windows that could be opened. It costs $300,000 to build, about equal to a year's gross annual revenue um, for the three years of construction. By 1880, in fact, they built their new foundry next to their first factory. It was a one-story building, uh, approximately 90 yards long and 20 yards wide. Quote, in using the fish oils, some means of ventilating that will carry away the disagreeable, disagreeable odor should be employed. Jed Carboni says, with coke fires burning, molten steel flowing, whale oils hissing and casting rattling, foundries were loud, hot, dusty, dark, and dangerous places. But Brown and Sharp turned itself into an incredibly successful one. The workday began at 7 a.m., six days a week, and ended at 6 p.m. And of course, the whistle blew to start and end the day. In 1910, Brown and Sharp employed more than 4,000 workers operating well over 1,000 machines powered by belts off a central shaft. By grabbing one of the loops, an operator could attach the belt to an overhead shaft to the engine, to the engine of the machine or detach it to cut the power. You can see that at Slater Mill, if you go down there and see some of that in Wilkinson Mill, how those uh, belts and loops would operate. He says, the factory is commodious, well ventilated, admirably lighted from all sides and arranged especially for the work executed upon its various floors. Attached to the main building in the boiler house containing a battery of six boilers of 50 horsepower each, also a case hardening room with three furnaces, the first and second floors are devoted to the manufacture of heavy machinery, and the third floor to the finer classes of light machinery. Each floor of the building is a complete workshop and is connected by telephone to the office, the other floors, the case hardening room, and the foundry. The company uses 586 machine tools, nine wood working machines, 19 polishing wheels, five smith shop hammers, seven foundry rattlers, and nine grindstones in its works. And Brown and Sharp now made 240 different items. By 1913, the plant had grown to 967,000 square feet across 28 acres. In 1914, the company began the year with 4,132 workers and faced the worst recession since the Panic of 1893. So they were just letting folks go. Young Lucian was estranged from the family and business was slack. So in June, Henry decided to take an extended leave. But in just a couple of weeks, the world would be in turmoil. And by the end of July, the world was at war. Woodrow Wilson urged Americans to stay neutral in thought as well as action. Still, many new immigrants went back to their home nations from which they had, and fought for those nations, except for, as we know for American history, the Hungarian population, most of which stayed in the US. Early consequence of the war was high prices. Merchants were anticipating high demand, but there was also still high unemployment. 
Combine that with the disenfranchisement, disfranchisement of many immigrants and merchants, and it was a recipe for disaster. There was incredible inflation and price gouging, and on Federal Hill for four days, people rioted, smashing windows and stealing goods. This event is popularly known in Rhode Island's history as the Macaroni Riots. But there was also, at this moment of the beginning of the war, an uptick in orders to the factory. Brown and Sharp received a mass order for machine tools from Germany. They rushed to fill the orders, piled it aboard a freighter that only made it to Copenhagen when Britain seized the ship and all of the machinery. William Vile, an executive then headed from Brown and Sharp, headed to Denmark to meet with the Germans. Um, and Germany begged Brown and Sharp to work with them, but England wouldn't let goods through and Vile declared that their business with Germany must cease. England, France, and Russia flooded Brown and Sharp with orders to equip armories and engine makers. Ports sat filled with goods, too many ship for ships to carry to allied cities. Companies could not keep up with orders. France actually had Brown and Sharp send screw machine operators over to show their machinists how to use them so they could gear up more quickly. In fact, we locally then had a problem in our own mini war with Connecticut as Connecticut tried to pilfer the staff of Brown and Sharp companies in Connecticut because they were seen as among the best and the production was too much for Rhode Island alone to handle. So Brown and Sharp, within just a year of facing its worst recession, now had a workforce of 5,500. And in no time flat, about 2,700 of them went out on strike as they tried to keep up. But Brown and Sharp outlasted that strike if not the one we are more familiar with later in the 20th century. And in 1915, as the strike begins, Henry Sharp had no time for unions. Um, and in September of 2015, 2,000 employees walked out and they rehired 2,000 more. According to Carbone, the war years stymied innovation, but hyper-stimulated production. And so this is something that important that we note throughout the history of uh, industry here in Rhode Island and elsewhere. And that is at times of mass per massive production, we don't see a lot of innovation. The trick is making sure that you're investing in innovation when you don't have a lot of production. And that's what Brown and Sharp mastered so well. Summer of, of 1916, Brown and Sharp faced a backlog of one year of or between orders and deliveries because of international demand and the local strike. Price for steel and other raw materials was up 40%. So I think now more than ever, we're familiar with the effects of inflation and supply chain issues. Henry attributed two thirds of Brown and Sharp's orders to war related business and the remaining were for the civilian automobile industry. At this point, legislation stepped in where unions had failed and workers uh, got the right of an eight hour day and the right to unionize. So now they have the right to unionize and that makes striking more effective. So when it was simply strikers who were not in within the unions, because Brown and Sharp was not a union shop, they could strike, but it was not an organized <laughs> strike the way you would see later with um, more unionization. People trying to pass laws uh, were trying to pass laws as well to stop uh, the use of stopwatches within, and this is the Tavner Bill of 1916, um, and also to stop other forms of scientific management, which were making their way onto shop floors. So we, uh, the U.S. enters the war April 6, 1917. In 1917, Brown and Sharp employees, there were 1,312 non-U.S. citizens. And the firm launched a campaign to help all of those people who wished to become citizens to do so. The changes in demographics uh, was very threatening to upper management and to many of the uh, Yankee, established Yankee population in Rhode Island. Um, so Brown and Sharp offered classes in both English and civics. Um, and all but 201 of those 1,300 people applied for citizenship. This movement, uh, mass movement of uh, immigrants and a need for a larger labor force also caused a bit of a housing crisis. Henry Sharp chaired the committee created by the Chamber of Commerce to study housing conditions in Providence. 
and triple deckers were seen as a big part of the problem. So we see this and learn much about what was called, as many of you know, the triple decker menace. Uh, it was written about by a man named John Ilder, um, who was hired to come in in 1916 and do an assessment of housing in Rhode Island. In 1916 housing census, there were still uh, just over 1,800 outhouses within the city limits of Providence, open cesspools, and cellar water closets, all of which were deemed unsafe and unsanitary. So this gives you, this uh, extended quote will give you a bit of a flavor of how it was that they talked about the problem of housing and, um, and builds upon what I, what I spoke about earlier. Our interest in the symbols of present and future has the same basis, a vital concern in the ideals and the spirit of the present and future generations. Dubloon and Bullion Streets speak of the desire for wealth achieved through adventure and daring. Dollar and Dime speak of desire for wealth achieved through industry and thrift. Adventure pursued too far would be mere lawlessness. The Rhode Island of the past sometimes approached the borderline, but it saved itself. Thrift pursued too, pursued too far would become mere short-sighted miserliness. Will Providence save itself from this? Benevolent, benefit, hope, recall the successful effort to meet the great issue which confronted men uh, in the day of their christening. Will Angelo Raphael Hassan remind our successors of achievement or failure in our effort to make a new people? In the Triple Decker Menace, they go on to say, if two families pay better than one, then three pay should pay better than two. That sounded like good arithmetic, but the frequency frequency of the Tillet signs tells that the popularity is falling off. Only with the Jews and the Italians does the three-decker seem to have real success, although of late Italians are going for double triple-deckers triple for six families. Other people are beginning to shun the three-decker. They realize that it lowers one's social standing to be rated a three-decker dweller. Having had one experience as a middle-floor tenant with tramping feet on the thin board floor overhead, the aroma of cooking and household laundry from the lower floor, sensed all the discomfiture of back stairway tramping and general clutter on the landings, the quarrels over priority of yard use on wash day and the nuisance of children squabbling for various and vexatious reasons. They have moved on to the greater joy and comfort of the two tenement house. And the landlord has been the sufferer and will continue to do, be so until he is fortunate enough to unload to the best advantage he can. Other cities are safeguarding themselves against three-deckers, as Providence should do. Massachusetts has three cities and towns that have laws prohibiting the erection of three-deckers. Bridgeport, Connecticut found it necessary to place a ban upon this nuisance. And of course, we know that by 1923, Rhode Island and Providence does the same. So in terms of Brown and Sharp, the company actually needs to continue to grow. So who are they going to hire? Um, and they hire, in fact, um, extend employment to women in 1918, and they give them nine hour shifts. Um, in World War I, Brown and Sharp uh, employs just under 1,500 women. Um, and I love this. Um, there are um, fewer accidents and for, fewer mistakes uh, among the women workers than uh, the male workers. Um, and when they were asked to account for this, they said it was because of the exceptional training the men gave them. Um, so I knew there was a good reason for it. So they divided the workers in this period, the men and women alike, um, into, and this was their language, English speaking races of American, English, Canadian, Irish, and Scots and non-English speaking races, French, French Canadian, Swedes, Norwegians, Italians, Jews, and Russians. Um, of the women, there were no Asians, no African Americans, and no Spanish speakers. By late August 1918, more than 7,000 employees um, uh, were employed at Brown and Sharp. They held loyalty mass meetings, and Brown and Sharp workers this is important here. Brown and Sharp workers loaned the United States government $1.4 million at 4% interest in the Liberty Loan Program. 
um, and when they sought to raise just $25,000. So these are the, the men and women working at the shop raised and pooled this money for Liberty Loans. But Brown and Sharp was by far um, kind of not the only uh, organization impacted by World War I and not the only outfit uh, in Rhode Island doing precision machine work. One of the biggest, in fact, uh, you can learn much more about up at the Museum of Work and Culture um, in the Mills Along the Blackstone um, uh, exhibit that we have. So again, I urge you to take a look at all of the mills that we'll see from this moment on. You can read much more and learn much more about their stories up at the museum. Um, but Taft Purse um, is actually a leader in precision manufacturing um, at this time. So in September 1901, Daniel Taft retires from Taft Purse um, and Herman Hollereth purchases the company for a syndicate out of Boston and New York. The syndicate uh, retained the name of the company and Edwin Purse remained in charge of it. Prior to 1914, Taft Purse uh, produced, and I will just let you know for all of you out there wondering why I'm saying Taft Purse and not Taft Pierce. It is because if you talk to anyone there, they will tell you that it is uh, not Pierce and it drives them crazy um, that everyone calls it Pierce. And there's in fact a limerick I will not be reciting um, that makes it clear that it rhymes with purse um, and worse. So um, F. Steel Blackall uh, shared that limerick with me and I do you the favor of not sharing it here today. <laughs> so, um, so Taft first used to produce um, sewing machines and did special order machine work for third parties. However, at the outbreak of the First World War, the company was one of the few in the country that could produce the tooling and gauges necessary for increased wartime manufacturing that would soon come. Between 1914 and 1918, the company organized a special war production department to produce type four shrapnel time fuses for the British and Russian governments, and also manufactured many aircraft parts for Gnome, Rolls-Royce, and Liberty Motors. So we think about again, oh, you know, in Rhode Island and one socket, they're making things that then go out to the war. And we think about blankets, we think about the Ghost Army um, in World War II, but we really have to think too about World War I, this precision work that is going on and World War I sets these companies up and then continues um, to fuel them and be prepared uh, when later work in precision is needed. But this is extraordinary um, specific kinds of work that these international governments and international other countries could not get anywhere else. So here's some views into Taft Purse. So you can see here the two sides of the work that's going on in places like Taft Purse, even Gorham, if you will, but in Brown and Sharp. And that is the labor, the skilled labor in manufacturing, but then the drafting rooms and the design and the drawing and the math that goes into this highly skilled precision work. Taft Purse and other organizations, other companies like it also participate in Americanization in ways that you're all, I'm sure, very familiar with, not just those classes in English and in civics, but also through things like baseball. And so, you know, we can learn about baseball at our museums, we can learn about um, Nap uh, LaJoy, however you want to say it, however his family wants to say it. Um, and uh, but we can see this as a process of building relationships and building camaraderie and loyalty that is to the company and to the working community. So expanding that community beyond ethnic group, beyond um, and beyond the churches that were providing so much community support. So these are again, attempts at, and sometimes very successful at Americanization and at community building. But it was not just the fact that we were, so here we are, we're, we're as Rhode Island, we're bringing in um, thousands, tens of thousands of people from all over the world are flooding into our labor market here to work in these mills. We've also looked at the ways in which these mills are creating things, making things and sending them overseas that no one else can produce in the rest of uh, in the rest of the world. So we see these two sides of the globe. But there's something else really interesting that happens in particular around Winsocket. 
and around the Blackstone Valley. And that has to do um, with Woonsocket politician and then uh, Rhode Island's governor, Aaron Pothier. Um, and in 1889, um, Woonsocket politician uh, Pothier um, was appointed by Rhode Island's then governor, uh, Royal C. Taft, as a representative to the Exhibition Universelle de Paris, um, the World's Fair in Paris, um, marking the centennial of the storming of the Bastille. Pothier's travels to Europe took him to the to textile centers around France and uh, and Belgium. This is where he met representatives of textile producers in an effort to spark interest in establishing facilities in Rhode Island and in particular in one socket. Through these efforts, uh, Charles uh, Tiburgian, uh, and Anne can correct me on any pronunciations she so chooses, um, president of the textile firm Charles Tiburgian and Sons based in Turkling, France, um, purchased a six acre parcel in 1906 from the then owners of Hamlet Mill property. He constructed a substantial worsted yarn spinning and finishing mill on the site, which opened in mid 1907 and employed 200 operators. And this is the kind of the size of these firms, right? So some of the firms are local and homegrown. We see people who are coming up through Rhode Island who are creating these firms. This is in 1900, the textile firm uh, BB uh, and R Knight operated 22,000 spindles and 512 looms of cotton, sh on cotton sheeting at Clinton Mills, employing 360 operators. Um, the Knight firm was dissolved in 1923 and the mill passed into other hands. So we have these mills established by a known Rhode Island and Massachusetts families. And then we have these new firms that are coming in from France and Belgium, creating complementary and sometimes comp competing textile mills in the Blackstone Valley. These are just some beautiful kind of artistic photos from inside the Clinton Mills. In 1901, the Globe Mill of Social Manufacturing, like many cotton mills in the area, was flourishing. And noting the success of social manufacturing, um, three mill sites, Social, Norse, and Globe. The Lippitt family, whose holdings included the social manufacturing, consolidated their Manville companies and their enterprise. The newly formed partnership made them the city's largest textile producer, with just over 1,700 workers. Um, and I will say, if you wish to learn more about Globe Manufacturing, in the next issue of Rhode Island History that is coming out, you'll not only get to read a great account of the last 25 years in the Museum of Work and Culture, but a really, really fascinating account of the blues and the creation of um, and the manufacturing that's going on in this period. So um, you'll get that if you're a member of the RHS. If you're not, it might be worth joining, just saying. And here are some really wonderful pictures of the, the Globe Mills. So back we go to the effect of Aaron Pothier. And in 1895, Belgian textile manufacturer Joseph Guerin, um, who established Guerin Spinning in Woonsocket a few years earlier, purchased an existing mill site uh, as a location for their second Woonsocket um, enterprise, Philmont Worsted. The Philmont Worsted Company was a three-story brick industrial building located in Jenksville, a densely uh, settled industrial settlement and residential area um, north of downtown Woonsocket. And they produced the worsted, which we talked about earlier, and merino yarns. We then go to the uh, Jules uh, Desormont mill. Um, and he is one of the several uh, worsted mills built by French and the Belgian textile owners in the early 20th century as a result of Pothier's visit. In 1907, Jules, uh, Jules and Georges Desormont, who operated the uh, Desormont en Fils uh, uh, factory in France, began planning the construction of their Woonsocket mill. Construction was completed in 1909, and production of worsted and merino yarns began at the facility with 14,400 mule spindles and 1,800 twisting spindles. By 1910, the company employed 346 operators. And we also know a bit about what this does in one socket, right? So we think about Rhode Island and the world, and we've talked about that the influence of French Canadians. One of the things that brings, that attracts these mill owners at Pothier's recommendation is that there's a French speaking workforce here. And so now you're bringing in French and Belgian French speaking uh, owners to the mix. 
And this allows a real flourishing of French language, French culture, French Canadian culture in Woonsocket that is not as impacted by the Americanization movements in terms of English speaking as you have in other areas like around Warwick. And so it is this incredible center of industry of French speaking industry and culture right here in Woonsocket that is unlike almost anything else you can find in the United States. And so we look at that in this period is when that's really solidified through the French speaking at every level of industrial engagement in this area. And it's, it's just an absolutely extraordinary story. And again, we have these other companies like Social, Lafayette Worsted, um, that continue um, to bring in that same kind of energy. And people are working in these mills, some for a lifetime, but many moving from place to place. Depending upon the skilled labor that they do, they may be able to move up in their positions um, as they go through the mills in this community. So you may have people who stay. If you go and you look at um, the exhibits at MOWC and you look at um, people's, uh, you can go in and you can submit your family's story, but you can also look at other people and see the number of mills in which they may have worked in the 20th century, two, three, four, five different mills. And, um, but all of them are shaped by this period of, uh, of, of global immigration, of global exchange that is spurred by the war and by the international and entrepot nature of Rhode Island. And so these are just a few more of the wonderful um, images and stories that we have here. One socket machine and press that has a thousand employees by 1911. And of course, one of our favorites, the Bernay Worsted, um, which uh, was incorporated in 1914 and named for William Barnett, a uh, menswear buyer for Sears Roebuck and William Naismith, an agent from the Scotia Worsted Mills. The company produced menswear and worsted goods and also fabricated heavy shirting flannels for the War Department during World War I. According to government records, the company was paid $1.72 per yard for an order consisting of 50,000 yards of cloth. The enterprise began with 30 looms and was originally housed in a nearby building that's since been destroyed. But all of that manufacturing and all of those stories are now deep embedded in the spirit of this place that uh, houses our Museum of Work and Culture. So that is just a, a quick romp through some of uh, Rhode Island and the world in this period. So thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Morgan. This was super, super interesting. Thank you. Um, so I am sure that some of you probably have some questions for Morgan. And um, Morgan, you're comfortable with people just asking out loud. You do not need to write them in the chat. So you can just, just raise uh, your hand. Yep. Just raise your hand or uh, unmute your your mic, and we'll take some. Morgan will take some uh, questions. Yes, Kate. You're muted. <laughs> this has been very interesting. I worked in Woonsocket for many years and um, just seeing the, um, the mills, a lot of them empty. Um, I, I kind of wish there was such a thing as a uh, um, a machine you can go into to go to the past and see them working. Um, I have a question about the churches um, in the city. Um, was um, it seemed like some of the churches just went for um, like one church would be mainly French Canadian, another might be Polish, um, and is there something having to do with the proximity to certain mills that, you know, there might be that connection also. Well, I'm not sure that I can, uh, Anne may be able to speak more specifically or someone else of the call to certain churches. I will say that looking at industrial areas in general in Rhode Island, um, so what you would get 
um, in terms of these different churches or parishes being constructed is that as groups would come in, they would in fact do massive fundraising amongst their community to, to construct a church for, so you'll see the first Irish parish or the first French Canadian parish being built. And then as the communities grow, there's a need for more and more of these churches. My understanding is more that they are being constructed near kind of neighborhoods that are, are community groups that are that are established at that time. So more of like the where people are living residentially, all of which is largely walkable to the mills. Mm -hmm. So because it's not as expansive in a place like one socket, you have that walking distance that isn't as much of a hindrance as you may get in places like Philadelphia. Um, where, you know, you, you would have to take, people would be taking streetcars from one place to an, another. Um, and even in, um, even in Providence, in Providence, you don't get the construction of mill housing in the same way that you get along the Blackstone Valley proper. And that does change where things are placed. So things are not, the services like churches aren't um, related in Providence to the manufacturing at all, but more towards the concentration of the population in terms of their residences. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Mr. Bob Sloan, chair of the board of the RHS, thank <laughs> you for being here. Thank you, that was a terrific presentation. I really, really liked it. Um, of course, the mills wound up uh, going south the ones that survived. Um, can you, why don't you give us, could you give us your, your brief take on why that was? Yeah, so there's a number of reasons <clears throat> that the mills end up moving south. Some of it has to do with organized labor um, and some of it has to do with um, uh, taxing and cost of land. So uh, as I noted with some of the, and this is particularly true of the textile industry. Um, and so um, textile industries have long, especially cotton, has had a long relationship with the with the South. And so often families, even the Slaters, right? They are, they are embedded in the South already. So you've got people who had been acting as factors, buying cotton, trading cotton, um, and working in those areas since the 19th century. So those are established relationships. In fact, if you go back and look at Civil War monuments, you'll see that they're putting, Rhode Island's putting up monuments in places where it wasn't fighting. And that's because they had these embedded relationships and family members in the South already. So you have established relationships and then you have increasing costs of land and increasing costs of labor um, in the Northeast. And uh, so when I say organized labor, I mean that there isn't as much established organized labor in the South. Um, and so, of course, manufacturers are looking at their costs, and, and this seems like a more affordable option for them and one that might be less complicated. You also have, um, within the South, you have um, uh, people of African heritage who are now working in industry and therefore are part of a labor force um, that can be used, especially around textiles, which has skilled and unskilled components to it. So through the early part of the 20th century, things are starting to move south. And it really, by the mid 1920s, is when you see the majority of textile mills located in the south rather than New England for the first time. So there's still active textile manufacturing here. Cotton in particular and some woolens um, are by 1924 majority in the south. And again, it has to do with the cost of production. It's many of the same uh, motivators and arguments we see for moving overseas later. Thanks, Morgan. I was, uh, that's how I got to the South. That's why I'm interested. <laughs> David? Hi, how are you? Very nice well, to meet how are you. you. Nice to meet you Good. too. Um, I'm wondering more about like the Woonsocket industrial past. Like, do you guys have uh, a catalog of like the Woonsocket rubber company mills over by Island Place behind the Museum of Work and Culture? 
I am not sure, uh, Anne may know this better than, than I, um, so they were not one of the mills, I believe, that was included in the mills along the Black Zone. Is that correct, Anne? Um, and that had to do with, I believe, an inability to find a lot of the records. Mm -hmm. We do have some like U.S. rubber, Alice Mills, um, that kind of material. And much of, so you can, some of the research materials are available at the Harris Library, but then also in the RAHS Library. But that company in particular, I don't think was one of the ones that they were able to find or have uh, the business archives for. Correct. Sorry, I couldn't answer your question better. It's totally fine, no worries. Francine. It's great to talk. Uh, I was wondering, like, the Brown and Shop building that, buildings that you saw and the Nicholson File Company, those buildings were huge. Huge. Where were they and yeah. what happened to them? <laughs> So some of them, of course, still stand. You can see them on the side of the road when you're going to buy the mall. Um, so if you look off uh, to your to your right and you see the foundry building and the promenade and all of that area. Um, and so some of them still stand. Others have been demolished. You know, um, we demolished a number of them around the construction of the highways. Um, and then um, others, I mean, we have a a pretty decent, but the highway also right changes our relationship to the ones that still stand. And so, you know, you can see more if you get off the highway and go down Kinsey and you go down Kinsley Street and these other areas, you go around the steel yard back in there, you can even see some of Nicholson file. You can really go and still see a lot of the, those buildings. But other places, of course, we know this uh, from the recent, visually from the recent documentary, places like Gorham, which are staggering in their size, um, are just completely demolished. Um, it is um, hard for us, I think, to even imagine what the demolition of these places looks like. We've had the demolition of mills along 95 outside of Central Falls recently, and it is, um, it is a massive undertaking. Um, and should cause question, you know, like where does all that debris go? Uh, where does that material go? What are the costs of demolition? People think about demolition being cheaper than rehabilitation, and that's not the case, both environmentally or uh, financially. Um, and so, um, but there were times where we didn't really care about that. Um, and so, um, so I think that it is um, it is amazing, but some of them are just eradicated. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking not too long ago to um, a New England baseball association that was in town, um, looking at many of these same areas, um, but also their relationship then, you can often find the old baseball fields um, right next to, there was a big one right next to where Nicholson file was, and it's, it's really fun to look at the mill records versus the baseball records and start to kind of understand why things were where they were why these recreational areas are adjacent to these mills. Um, but yeah, I, I really recommend getting off of the highway and going around that area, and you'll see a lot more of Brown and Sharp than you might imagine. Now, Kate again, you're muted again. Okay, you were talking about the triple deckers and how there was a law passed um, to uh, to stop the building of them, and um, I was wondering where where that was coming from. Was it from management? Was it from city government? Um, and I I was just thinking of the the difference between housing in the mill villages, like I, I live in Georgiaville, and um, that people would come and they would live in the houses that were built by the, the mill owners, um, I guess, and pay rent. So what, um, can you say more about that? Sure. So triple deckers, you know, um, as I was sort of alluding to earlier, in some of these city centers outside of the mill village concept, right, we don't have the companies building subsidized housing. 
They try it a little bit in Providence. They try it a little bit in, in East Providence. It doesn't really catch on. And that has a lot to do with the fact that um, they, there is so much mobility between jobs. So you're not having the way with a mill town where people are working there in a company town with kind of the company controlling the store. We see that a bit with Rumford Chemical Works um, right across the, the river, but not as much with the textile mills and precision manufacturing in both Providence and in, um, and in Woonsocket. So what they need is another form of housing that can hold a lot of people and can be put up relatively easily. And, and that's done um, in often on spec. Uh, there's a couple mill owners who try to um, support some triple deckers being purchased, but quickly other people, and in fact, um, a man whose last name is, is Rakitansky um, in uh, Providence and his, his son became an architect uh, and then another son became a doctor, a well-known doctor in the area. Um, he devises a way to build these really kind of quickly and almost in a modular fashion. So early modular building. And what you see is the construction of kind of different levels of triple deckers. So ones that are very ornate with built-ins, external um, decoration, and then down to the very sort of kind of um, bare bones versions of them in, in poorer areas. So you've got these kind of different levels. The issue becomes a very kind of paternalistic movement in the end of the 19th century, where you have a lot of, you know, the housing inspection idea comes out of this. But that housing inspection movement begins with volunteer groups, frequently of women, who are going in and they're concerned about things like privacy. Um, this is also part of Americanization. You know, it's privacy, it's, you know, it's certain ideas about food ways, certain ideas about child rearing. And it is seen by the um, newer populations as very judgmental, very degrading, um, because they are basically being asked by these very paternalistic overseers to come in and say, change your behavior to be more like us. Whereas within the triple deckers, right, you have a lot of families living together, extended families. What we see within the kind of uh, established Yankee families is in this exact same time period is families is more mobility, people living farther apart from extended families, right? So we see that trend happening while you see the re more recent immigrant groups coming in and wanting to live near people who worship like them, who speak the languages and celebrate, uh, recognize the same cultures that they do. So you have this profound clash. When you start to then institutionalize and professionalize, um, this kind of oversight into building inspection, housing inspection and authority, it then gives them ways to create laws that are then supported by the wives of the people who are in power. And then they, their husbands support these things. And they do things like pass laws that, that focus not on, and this is what's so interesting to me, right? The laws rarely talk about people. The laws talk about houses. And so the house becomes very much, the triple decker is such a symbol for the recent immigrant, um, but they can outlaw the house, but they need the workers. And so what they do is basically the first law that gets changed is, um, is that they say that before a tenement was any building with um, more than three separate and distinct families and groups. They then change the language to a tenement being three or more, and then they outlaw tenements. So a two family is not a tenement, but a three family is. And in the rest of the United States, tenement becomes a very derogatory word for housing. It really is only in Southern New England um, that I have seen and heard tenement just being used in its very literal definition in a non pejorative way. And so it is this group that's trying to Americanize that is setting these laws in place, they say, for the good of the people living in them, um, for privacy, for quiet, for sanitary. They're saying with the flu, this comes up a lot, right? And we know from the recent pandemic what it means to be living in places where you cannot get separation, right? So they use the Spanish flu as a reason for why these houses are unsafe. And that helps solidify the need, the, what they say is the need for the law.
Do we have more questions from Morgan? David has a, a question. Yeah. So during your research and studies of like all these different mills throughout Rhode Island and the Blackstone Valley and Providence, between like Blackstone Valley and Woonsocket, do you have a specific mill that you were drawn drawn to? And also you mentioned about demolition. Has any of the mills that you were more profound and had more of a connection to, has they have they been demolished? Um, yeah, and, you know, I mean, for me, they're not necessarily the ones that have appeared in this talk. They're the ones sort of in the Pawtucket Central Falls area. And mm -hmm. un unfortunately, um, two of them, uh, parts of, uh, so for me, Conant Mills is one of the most extraordinary um, building complexes. Um, I also love the webbing company that was right over on the end, uh, sort of as you're going past Dexter. Um, and you're going down uh, Main Street, Pawtucket, and uh, that burned a number of years ago when they were converting it. Um, and so, you know, the, when the fire happened right off of Rand as well, just a few years ago, I mean, that was just absolutely devastating. Um, so I would say those are the ones that for me, but, you know, I absolutely, I mean, if, if any of you get the chance, if you haven't been around those areas to see, I mean, for me, I love um, the overhead walkways. Mm -hmm. um, and the preservation of those walkways is, um, to me, one of the most glorious kind of things to save from these mills. So those those are the ones that um, I'm not exactly sure why. I mean, for many of you who are here um, who know me, um, know that I lived in Central Falls for a long time, and um, and it's very close to my heart. And I've been in Pawtucket for for quite some time as well. Um, and I just I I am so um, drawn to the stories that they that they have to tell us about the communities. And um, and so it's just such a privilege to be able to also then not just love them, but to be able to work with people too, who dedicate their lives to sharing these stories and, and this history. Um, so those are my favorites. So since you brought up the Conan thread, I made a documentary about it um, and I premiered it at Slater Mill for a movie event that we were ho hosting last year but I think you'd be interested. But that's also the first mill that really struck my chord to have like an obsession about these. And I think um, also Francine's in this video chat. And uh, I'm, I've met her a few times and she's seen the film, I think. And she used to work at Paramount Carding. And so mm -hmm. I went to the mill and I grabbed her Paramount card that was on the ground so that she could have her like a memory and a brick. <laughs> and especially the brick, I was very, very impressed. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. 